So here we have an object that looks like a book, but in fact, it's a box with a book inside it, a matching book. And this has been placed like a jewel in this velvet lined box because it is a very precious object. It is a copy of the first folio of Shakespeare's plays. And there is a title page with this very famous image of Shakespeare gazing out at us. So the book that is commonly known as Shakespeare's First Folio is in fact the first collected edition of Shakespeare's plays that was published 400 years ago in 1623, several years after Shakespeare himself had in fact died. There are 36 plays by Shakespeare in this book and half of them had not been previously printed. So this book preserves really half of Shakespeare's complete works. Plays that would probably have been completely lost to us include The Tempest, Macbeth, Twelfth Night, many others that are among people's favourites today. Some people expect us to be handling a book like this wearing white gloves, but actually the conservation advice now is to simply wash your hands before using it. Shakespeare wasn't around to put this book together himself. So it took quite a lot of people to gather the texts. Two of the important names are on the title page under Shakespeare's portrait. They're two printers, Isaac Jaggard and Edward Blount. But the initial impetus, we believe, came from two of Shakespeare's colleagues in The King's Men, his theatre company, and their names are to be found on the next couple of pages of the book. They are John Hemming, sometimes known as Hemmings, and Henry Condell, and they were fellow actors with Shakespeare, and they say that they are promoting his work not for any personal gain for themselves, uh, but because they want to make sure that he will be remembered. The term folio is really a common way of saying a big book, and big books, of course, bring to mind church bibles, important works of law or editions of classical authors that would be going into libraries or into the collections of rich people. Folios were expensive. So putting his plays together in a folio format was partly a matter of fitting 36 plays into a single volume, but it was also making a statement about his importance, about the fact that he was like a classical author. That's also the message of this big portrait in the front. The proposition of the book is that it is a work of important literature for people to read. The dedication is to readers, Ben Jonson's poem is to the reader. It's not a book for performing with. A very fascinating page that is included in the preliminaries is actually the names of the principal actors in all these plays. So there is a sense in which the men of the company have got a stake, have got some sort of relationship to these plays, even though the plays are being presented as literature which will last for all time. The format in which individual plays were published, Shakespeare's and others, was usually a quarto. And a quarto means a little book or a fairly little book. It's, you know, uh, a bit like paperback size today. They would have been sold at the time for sixpence or so. This is the previous edition to the first folio of the comedy Much Ado About Nothing, and it was published in 1600. So it's 20 plus years earlier than the first folio. A lot of the lines are actually marked, so one could imagine it could be used as a prompt. Here and there, there are notes for an entrance or an exit, or that two characters meet each other. So here, for example, it says, enter. In Shakespeare's time, actors would have received only their lines on sheets of paper. They would not have received the full play text for rehearsals and the performance. There would be a prompter's copy used to keep an eye on the action on stage. However, in the modern and contemporary period, we have far more sophisticated prompt copies and actors have the full published script throughout the whole rehearsal period and the performances. This prompt book is from a 1959 production of The Winter's Tale and it shows the complete process of the production on stage. 
It has the script pasted on every single page of the book alongside a stage and a lighting plot. So every cue for the music and the lighting changes throughout was recorded in this copy. It's a really great example of how Shakespeare's text has been readapted, revised, reinterpreted for different audiences over time. So from the 17th century when the first folio was published, which was already altered from previous editions, previous quartos, to now where we still make changes according to directors' preferences, performers and what audiences expect. First Folio has been the subject of endless scholarship and speculation. And in some ways, almost everything is known about how it went through the printing shop. And in other ways, there are quite fundamental facts that we don't know for sure still about it. It's not known for sure what was the fundamental text that was put together to give to the printers to produce this book. Half of the plays had never been printed before, so some kind of manuscript was evidently needed for those. The half of the plays that had been previously published, one of those, it is thought, would have been used as the base text, but very often they would have been corrected or amended from other sources, and that might have been prompt books from the theatres, or it might have been somebody else's transcription of a performance at some point. So it's quite a big editorial job to get all of this material together and decide what order it goes in and present it to the printers. Another way in which the first folio has really helped to determine the way that people think about Shakespeare and his plays is the way that they are actually organised in the book. There is a contents page, or what is called a catalogue page here, which divides them up into comedies, histories and tragedies. So it starts with comedies, but it includes Much Ado About Nothing, As You Like It, The Taming of the Shrew. And then the next category is the histories, starting with King John, going through the various Henrys and coming up to Henry VIII. And then the tragedies include Macbeth, Romeo and Juliet, so we don't know exactly how many were published. It was probably around 750, which was a decent print run for a book at this time. We know today the whereabouts of upwards of 230 of them. And that's actually a remarkable thing. Books of the early modern period don't normally survive in that many copies. And it's because this book is so treasured and famous that it has survived. The majority of them are in libraries, but there are still a few out there in private hands. Here at the V&A, we are lucky enough to have three first folios. The reason that we have three is that each came from a different donor in the 19th century. This copy comes from a library of a man called John Jones, who was a rich clothier, a merchant, a businessman, and he prized his Shakespeare's so much that he actually commissioned a bookcase with a carved head of Shakespeare and some roundels with heads of characters in to hold his first folio and that too is in the museum today. One of the very fascinating things of looking at early modern books like this is to see the ways in which their owners have used them. So if we look a bit more closely at this contents page, we can see that quite a few of the plays have got a kind of a symbol to the right of the actual title. It looks like a G. I don't know what that signifies, actually, but some clue to it can perhaps be derived from this page, a blank page early in the book, where an early owner of this copy has listed plays and indicated whether they themselves have either seen them performed or read them. They have an S for seen and an R for read, but they also have this G symbol alongside of some of them as well. And there are quite a number of other examples of usage. Here opposite The Winter's Tale, there is a comment, a very fine play in probably 17th or 18th century handwriting. And at the top of the same page, there is a note which says the list of characters is actually to be found at the end of the play. But if we turn to the end of The Winter's Tale, here we have 
an actual list of the characters with um, little signs and symbols or possibly the initials of performers that this owner had seen acting this play. Historically, the first folio was never used in a theatre for live performance. It was never meant to be a play script which would be used by a company of actors. However, due to the reappraisal of the first folio as a authentic source for Shakespeare's texts, it has been increasingly used by directors as part of their process and interpretation of Shakespeare's plays. And there was also a growing interest just generally in the history of the performance and the theatres that Shakespeare's plays were performed in, sparked by the discovery of a drawing of the Swan Theatre in the 1880s. Obviously the most important part of the first folio existing is that we have these plays recorded that would have been lost otherwise. And these have gone on to be reinterpreted and restaged countless times over the years by visionary directors and across genres, not just theatre, but also film and music and musical theatre as well. For example, The Taming of the Shrew, which was included in the first folio but had not been published prior to this, has been adapted many, many times, including into the musical Kiss Me Kate and also into the Hollywood film 10 Things I Hate About You. The first folio is this incredible resource as well for storytellers and theatre makers. For example, Romeo and Juliet, which is a famous tragedy of star-crossed lovers, but has been adapted into so many different forms of media, not just the Shakespearean play, which we see live on stage, but through musical interpretations like West Side Story or Anne Juliet, but also visionary reinterpretations like Baz Luhrmann's film version of Romeo and Juliet, which used the play script faithfully, but reimagined it in Venice Beach, in California, in America for a brand new audience. So the first folio is not just about Shakespeare's plays, it's the strength of these stories which have been retold so many times through so many mediums and are recognisable and beloved by so many different audiences because of the strength of the stories within them.